All right, it's good to uh, have everybody here. I think we got some people still on vacation, Tim and Pam. And uh, so uh, let's pray for Tim today. He's, uh, his ribs are hurting him, Judy said. So uh, let's remember him and that he gets to feeling better. And uh, so we won't trash talk him too bad today. So right, he gets enough of that, right? <laughs> so, all right, but uh, let's lift him up today too. And uh, I was out of town last week and uh, glad to be back with everybody. It's just good to, you know, be in the presence of your family. And I consider our church our family. And so it's just great when you miss, uh, you miss uh, being with the family. So, all right, let's pray. And uh, I'll go ahead and pray this morning. So. Father, just uh, thank you for everybody that can make it today, Lord. Uh, just thank you for this family group that you've uh, uh, brought us on this journey in this last couple of years, Lord, and how that we've started this new church and how that you're blessing us. I just pray that you'll help us to uh, make disciples and bring new people to our church, Lord, and uh, just bless us, help us to grow spiritually. I know you sure have, Lord, and I appreciate that. And I just pray you'll continue to do that. Bless Andy as he preaches today. Fill him with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and give him the words to say. I just pray for uh, those that are gone, that you'll bring them back safely with us. If any of them sick, I pray that you'll heal their bodies and uh, just bring them back too, Lord. And I pray for uh, Tim and Pam, that you'll bring them back safely and help Tim's ribs get to feeling better, Lord. And any anybody else that needs prayers in our group, Lord, you know. And I just pray that uh, we will just lift them up in your presence today. And ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. So we have some announcements to go over. And the first one is we have a pool party coming up July 22nd. That's going to be a big weekend for us, July 22nd, 23rd. Um, and here's why. So first we have this one, and we'll get more information as we get closer. And here's the other one. The 23rd is our, we're going to celebrate our one-year anniversary of being a church. That should get you a little bit excited. Yeah. It's actually the first Sunday, the third, but everybody's out of town for 4th of July. So we're going to celebrate the end of the month. And the VFW has agreed to let us have the area for a couple extra hours. So I'm going to have the smoker going all day Saturday. And we're going to take care of the meat. And if you guys can just bring like some sides and drinks and things like that, we'll have lunch together after the service is over. So we're working on some different things for that day. I think it'll be a a good day but it's hard to believe it's been a year we've been meeting in this location already so that's that's crazy a year they say the uh days are long but the years get short and i'm, I'm starting to feel that so most definitely let's see is there another one or is that the only one? okay good so we're continuing our series and with the gifts of the spirit and we've just got a couple weeks left in this study so i want to jump right in because we've got a lot to talk about as we go through so 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 says, A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Again, that word spiritual gift is given to us. That's, that word has to do with that given is manifestation. So this is the Holy Spirit manifesting these gifts inside of us so that we can help each other, so that we can uh, work together. The word is the symphony word, the word we get our word symphony from. So it comes together in harmony so that we can work together. Verse 8 to one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. So we looked at these. That's the word of wisdom. God gives us a small portion of His wisdom for direction. And the word of knowledge, He gives us God giving us a small portion of His knowledge uh, for information. Verse 9, the same Spirit gives, us, gives great faith to another. We talked about the three types of faith, saving faith, the faith we need to be saved, sanctifying faith, the daily faith that we need to be more like Jesus, and supernatural faith where we... Uh, God gives us that impression that he is going to act supernaturally. Verse, uh, continuing on, and to someone else, he gives the Spirit the gift of healing. And we talked about healing and how God is the one who heals, not us. We don't always understand why God heals some and he doesn't heal others. That we're supposed to pray for healing until God tells us to stop. That we've got to be willing to look like a failure because not everybody that we pray for is going to be healed. And it's because it's my job to pray and it's God's job to heal. Verse 10, he gives one person the power to perform miracles. And we talked about what a miracle is and the purpose of miracles and is it okay to pray and ask for a miracle. 
Verse 10 goes on, it says, He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. And last week we looked at that gift of prophecy. We saw what it is and is it for today. And, and we saw that the Holy Spirit will never force us and never force this gift on anybody. And sometimes we're not going to get it right because the message that he gives is always right. But sometimes the way we interpret it or the way that we uh, might think God is trying to say something isn't always it. So we're the fallible ones. He's the infallible one. He goes on and says, he gives another one, uh, someone else, the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. And that's what we're going to talk about today. This is the gift or the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. The NASB, New American Standard Bible, says that this, this gift, it translates it, the gift of distinguishing of spirits. Uh, the King James translates it, the gift of discerning of spirits. The original Greek word that's used is diakrisis, which is like a judicial estimation. So it's like going before a judge. Literally what it is, and I think this is up there for the next one, um, gift of being able to judge, and I'm sorry, it says gift of prophecy. It's supposed to say the gift uh, that we're talking about today, which is discerning of spirits. So back one. Next, go back just one there where it talks about the, the gift is literally the gift. There you go. The gift is literally the gift of being able to judge, like in a courtroom, what spirit is behind something or someone. That is this gift of discerning of spirits. So behind everything that happens, there's a, a spiritual power. It could be the spirit of God. It can be a good spirit or what we would call angels or an evil spirit that we would call demons or the human spirit. And this gift of discernment allows us to see the nature of the power behind the activity, what is happening. And just like the other gifts, this is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit inside of us. We can't just operate it on our own will. It's not like we have x-ray vision where we could just walk up to somebody and immediately see, oh, you're uh, being demonized. You're, that's a demon in you that's, that's affecting you. Or, or, oh, that's the Spirit of God that's on you, and, and our spirit will bear witness with his spirit, so we can see that a lot faster. Or that it's their own, just their own spirit that they have. So it's not just something you can turn on and off and something that we have the ability to control. It's God manifesting these gifts inside of us. Now, I have met people who this gift is pretty strong in. They can almost meet somebody and immediately tell a lot about that person. And my daughter Alyssa, I think, has this gift pretty strong. She has this, this ability to see and discern things sometimes that I don't even see and discern. And I know that many of you do too. So let's talk about what these spirits are. So there's the discerning of God's spirits, the first one that we're going to talk about. We have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, God's spirit, and recognize when he moves in, when he's doing something. Let me ask you this way. Have you ever been at a church service where you just felt or just sensed him like in a strong way kind of move in? Have you ever been in one of those before where you just knew something's going on, something's different? You know, as a pastor's kid, I grew up in church, and I can, I, I, I'm a little bit cynical at times because I feel like uh, I've grown up and in church all my life, I, I'd be able to tell somebody, say, oh, man, I just felt the Spirit strong today. And I'd be like, no, the room was just full. The music was good. That's what you felt. <laughs> you know, and it was, it's easy for us to get cynical when we're around church all of the time. And, and sometimes those things can, can creep in and cause an emotion that would make us make some people think. But if we're really tuned in, we can sense when the Holy Spirit is moving in. We've had it happen several times with us. And, and I mean, what, uh, just a few weeks ago, we had that extended time of prayer, remember, where we didn't even get to the message. We just talked about what God was doing and shifted our whole service. We've got to be sensitive to him. I think too many times, too many churches fall into that, they, they just get stuck into that three or four songs. And then, um, you know, after the songs, you have announcements. Then there's a sermon, and then there's an invitation, and then there's an offering. And if God doesn't move when he's programmed to in that 20 to 30 minute time, that's all he gets. And that's sad because it's so easy for us to fall into that. He's, it, we, we program the Holy Spirit right out of church if we're not careful. There's so many that wouldn't recognize the Holy Spirit dropping into a church service if he showed up and danced on their nose. <laughs> doesn't matter what we plan. We've got to be sensitive to him and be watching for his moving. Because if we're not sensitive to him, we're going to miss out on what he's doing. We'll miss him and we're going to miss what he wants to do for us and wants to do with us. We've got to discern the Holy Spirit. 
And we've got to be willing to let our human plans, our ideas, our preconceptions all take a back seat so that we don't miss out on what he wants to do. Because when he shows up, it'd be amazing. And when he shows up, we've got to be ready because it might not look like what we think it should look like. I mean, it could, it could wreck our plans. What if we didn't get to all the songs we were supposed to sing that day? How terrible would that be? Or how horrible would it be if God showed up, the Holy Spirit showed up during the worship time and there was no preaching? Some of you would be like, yeah, I'll take that every week. <laughs> but what if he did? Would we be okay with that? Would you be okay with that? I'd be okay with that. That'd be awesome. I mean, it may not look like what we think it should look like. Let me give you an illustration. 2 Samuel chapter 6 talks about this, talking about David. And David danced before the Lord. David sensed God's presence there with all his might, wearing a priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant with shouts of joy and the blowing of ram's horns. But as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she was filled with contempt. That word contempt means she despised him. It, was, it, it has to do with like a vile worthlessness she looked at him like. So she was filled with contempt for him. When David returned home, this is his wife. Have you ever felt like your wife looked at you that way, guys? <laughs> Don't answer that because anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of your home. Um, verse 20, <laughs> when David returned home to bless his own family, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. She said in disgust, how disgusting the king of Israel looked today. Why? Because he didn't follow the religious protocol that she thought he should follow. Shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girl like any vulgar person might do. David retorted to Michael, I was dancing before the Lord. I wasn't dancing before anybody else. I was dancing before the Lord in front of him who chose me above your father and all his family. He appointed me as the leader of Israel, the people of the Lord. So I celebrate before the Lord. Yes, I am willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. But those service girl, servant girls you mentioned will indeed think I'm distinguished. I wonder how many times we fight that feeling. David was willing to look like an idiot. He was willing to look foolish, to be humiliated while he was worshiping the Lord. Have you ever, let's put it into our, our today, has there been ever a time when you've been worshiping, whether it's through one of the songs or maybe it's in your car or maybe it's in a service and you just felt like, dancing and you didn't do it because you're afraid of what somebody else might think or say or how they might look at you. Or maybe you felt like falling to your knees or getting down on your face before God because you just had a sense of how holy he is. Or, or, or maybe it's to raise your hands or to cry or run around the room or whatever. But you fought it off because of your dignity. Because you didn't want somebody to look at you and think, oh, well, that's fake. Oh, well, they're just wanting attention. They're just wanting that. They're just putting a show on. Here they go again. And we miss out on what God was trying to do. We miss out on God wants, what God wants to do. Because what if someone else sees you worshiping with reckless abandon and then they begin to worship and then somebody else begins to worship and like dominoes that begin to fall, you could be the one who started it. Instead of worrying about what people think about us, we should be worried about missing out on what God has for us. We discern His Spirit, but sometimes we can ignore it. Then there's another kind of spirit, the discerning of angelic spirits. I firmly believe that there are angelic spirits around us, and Jesus saw them in His day, and Jesus saw them in the Garden of Gethsemane. And in Luke 22, it says, There an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. An angel from heaven showed up and gave and, and, and ministered to Jesus. Mary Magdalene saw one at the resurrection of the tomb in John 20. I believe angelic beings are still ministering to us today and carrying out God's will. Mary and Joseph saw angels before the birth of Jesus. Abraham and Sarah were visited by some angels. Even Lot was visited by some angels while he was in the middle of a horrible city of Sodom. I believe that they show up at times. 
Paul was even visited by an angel in the middle of a sea, of the ocean, in the midst of a, right after a storm in Acts 22. It says, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. Can you imagine? Don't, don't feel sad. The ship's going down, but you won't die in the middle of a storm in the middle of the ocean. Be, be like being on an airplane and turbulence and the wing comes off and some passenger stands up and says, it's okay, you're not going to die. The plane's going down, but you're not going to die. You'd be thinking, yeah, you're an idiot. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. But that's what happened here. Paul said, for, for last night, an angel of the Lord to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you, surely, you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God, is, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. I remember growing up hearing the stories. I heard the same story from several different pastors, which either means it's true or they all got together and made the same story up. And you never know with preachers sometimes. Um, no, I, I believe it was true. There was a, a missionary lady who was always, would always take the same route home after she served in the mission. She had to cross a bridge. This was overseas, and I forget the country. But she would always go over the same bridge and go going from her house to the mission and back. And it was many times late at night when she would make this trip. And there was a lot of robberies and a lot of crime in the area and even people murdered and killed. And one night on her way home, she was walking across the bridge and she saw a man who was coming over towards the bridge. And right about then, the police jumped out and grabbed this guy. And um, they the lady continued to walk up to him and uh, she they the, the, the man, the, the criminal, was asked why he didn't ever bother this lady because she was never bothered. And he looked at him and says, why would I bother her? She always has that big dude walking with her every single night across that bridge. And I thought, wow, you know, he saw what he needed to see. And I believe there, there was an angelic presence with her that protected her. And I believe that happens to us many times and we don't even know it. How many times God protects us from things and how many times it's angels that are around us. We hear stories like that and, and we believe them and we rejoice and we think, man, that's so awesome that God did that over in the mission field to take care of, of that, that missionary lady. But then if somebody was to say, hey, I, there was an angelic presence in my room last night, you'd probably think they need to be committed. You'd probably think they missed their medication or that they had pizza before they went to bed and had a dream. We'd think they were crazy. And some people might be crazy. I'm not taking that away. There are crazies. There are definitely crazies. But just because one person abuses the gifts doesn't mean we throw out all of the gifts. Just because one person practices them badly doesn't mean we should throw them out and not practice them at all. We don't do that in other areas of our life. Why would we do it with this? So there are angelic spirits. Then here's the third one. Discerning human spirits. Now I'm not talking about ghosts or anything spooky like that. But John 147 says, as they approached, Jesus said, now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. Jesus was talking to Nathaniel, and Jesus discerned a guiltless spirit in Nathaniel. That was not a spirit that was over Nathaniel, but that was his own spirit. He was a man of integrity. John 2 says, because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust him. But Jesus didn't trust them because he knew human nature. No one needed to tell him what mankind is really like. Jesus discerned the spirit that was on these people. He discerned their nature, their true nature, the spirit that was in them. He was sensing their character is what he was doing. It happened with Peter in the book of Acts as well. Uh, Acts chapter 8, when Simon saw that the spirit was given... When the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. Let me have this power too, he exclaimed, so that when I lay hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter replied, may your money be destroyed with you for thinking that God's gift can be bought. For you have no part in this, for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts. For I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and are held captive by sin. Peter discerned the inner motives of this man's heart, his spirit. Paul was given the gift as well, Acts 14. Um, while they were at Lystra, Paul and Barnabas came upon a man with crippled feet. And when, uh, he had been that way from birth. So he had never walked. He was sitting and listening as, Peter, as Paul preached. 
uh, looking straight at him, Paul realized he had faith to be healed. So Paul called to him in a loud voice, stand up, and the man jumped to his feet and started walking. Paul discerned he could see the spirit of faith in this man. He could sense his faith, the character that was in this man, in this crippled man. Have you ever met somebody and you just immediately knew that something was wrong with them? You ever met somebody like that? You just had this weird sense, like something's not right. Or you meet some people and you just think, man, I feel like I've known you forever. We're like, yeah, we're like best friends. <laughs> and we just met today. But sometimes there's that feeling of, ooh, something's not right with this person. And I've had that happen to me multiple times, and I usually share it with Noemi, and of course it proves to be right every single time. <laughs> no, but we can have that sense, and that's their spirit that is in them we can sense. So we've got to discern the human spirits. Then there's another spirit. There's discerning evil spirits. Matthew chapter 9 says, when they left a demon possessed, or that word demon possessed there is literally translated diamond ziamai, which is demonized, which is under the power of a demon, being influenced by a demon. So when they left, a demon-possessed man, a, de a demonized man who could not speak was brought to Jesus. So Jesus cast out the demon, and then the man began to speak. The crowds were amazed. Nothing like that had ever happened in Israel, they exclaimed. Jesus discerned this evil spirit in this man, and it was connected to his sickness. Now, not all sickness is caused by demons. We don't we're not walking around like the Ghostbusters looking for demons under every rock. That's not, that's not right. There's sometimes there's all kinds of reasons for sickness. But occasionally, a demonic presence can cause an illness. Matthew 12 talked about it. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and couldn't speak was brought to Jesus. He healed the man so they could both see and speak. The crowd was amazed. Could that be the son of David, the Messiah? This man's the demon that was oppressing. This man caused him to be blind or deaf and couldn't speak both so it's clear that jesus healed this man by casting out the demon and it caused his blindness and his muteness to leave him mark 9 one of the men in the crowd spoke and said teacher i brought my son to you and uh so you could heal him he's possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk man i wish my kids got that evil spirit sometimes don't you they couldn't talk i'm just teasing and whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. If you saw that happening to somebody at Walmart today, what would you think? Yeah, seizure. That's the first thing I would think, like they're epileptic or they're having some kind of seizure or sounds just like it. Yeah. So I asked your disciples to cast this evil spirit, but they could not do it. Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy, and when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into violent convulsions, and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy. The spirit often throws him into the fire or into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us. Help us if you can. What do you mean, if I can, Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak, he said. I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Then the spirit violent, uh, screamed. the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd as the people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet, and he stood up. Here's another time where a demonic spirit caused an illness. But again, this happens all, well, let me just, it, it happens all through the New Testament. We see Jesus, have, in Luke 13, we read about the spirit of infirmity. In Acts 16, we see a spirit of divination with Paul. But again, all sickness and all disease is not caused by demons but some are so we have to be aware of it not everything is physical not everything is spiritual there is both and that's why we've got to be able to discern the spirits that's why discern this gift of discerning the spirits is so important in the body of christ because it can be the spirit of god it can be good spirits evil spirits and a human spirit that's why we're given first john 4 1 that says this 
Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. We've got to test the spirits. We've got to be able to discern what spirit is behind what is happening. Again, that gift is not an on-demand gift where you can just automatically turn it on and see it. It's the Holy Spirit manifesting this gift in us for his purpose and his time. And we have to be sensitive to him. So, let's talk about it. Because this is an interesting one. Do you think we all have one angel? I don't know. You know, the scripture is not clear on it. I believe there are angels that minister to us, but, you know, I don't know how many, or I don't know if we have like one that's assigned to us. I know some people believe they have a guardian angel. I know others who say, well, I've killed three or four of them as rough as I've been. You know, they, they had to die saving my life and you know I've gone through three or four, but I, I don't know that I believe that. Um, but yeah, I believe that they're there to protect us and take care of us and minister to us. Definitely. It's kind of like the story of the Old Testament prophet when the, the whole nation came up against the, the armies came up to get him and Gehazi comes in and gets him and says, hey, come out. And he says, um, they were there to arrest him. And he prayed, the prophet prayed and said, Lord, would you open Gehazi's eyes? And he saw the armies of the Lord surrounded by him. I don't know if each one of us gets that many or if it's just the prophets, but that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> Can you imagine having an army of angels surrounding you everywhere you go? That's pretty cool. You guys are quiet. Come on. Think, ask questions, talk. What stands out to you about this? What do you think? I just don't know about that. Yeah, there's a lot of people who will do that eisegesis, read themselves into the story. You can take the story of David and Goliath, and they'll tell you, you know, every one of us has a David in us, and what, what Goliath are you facing? And while that application is good, that's not what the story's about. They've read themselves into the story, and, and we've got to be careful not to do that. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Yep. Um, I, I think that... You know, obviously, some demons can manifest themselves, like with that little boy convulsing and foaming at the mouth. But I also think that a lot of times they don't manifest that way. And I think, I think Hollywood has made us leery to talk about demonic activity because <laughs> of yeah. all the exorcist stuff. And any they've made it like scary. And while it is, it's it's not like that. And sometimes, you know. Satan sometimes comes as an angel of light, and um, but I think we just we need to talk about it more because strongholds in our life are demonic, and we have to be repentant to get free from that, and um, and not think of it in like Hollywood terms of demonic. Yeah, so people would all the times you know people outside of the church, and even some people inside a church, you know, you start talking about angels and demons, and they get weirded out. Like, oh, well, you know, I don't know about that, but they'll go watch The Exorcist, you know, and that's okay. Or they'll watch, you know how many movies there are about demons in the movie theaters right now? There's like three or four. I mean, there's this new one where Russell Crowe, I just saw a preview of it, is a some kind of exorcism priest or something crazy like that. I mean, the, the world is more open to talking about demonic stuff than the church is. How sad is that? Man, did we get duped somewhere? That's because they don't think it's real necessarily. 
I think they think of it as a, a mythic, mythical type thing. And some maybe. Some of those, I mean, some of the people that are making mm -hmm. movies just think of it as a fantasy. And, you know, even some of the stuff based on true stories. They, mm -hmm. Like you said, if you talk like you think it's true, they, they think you're crazy. But I think that, personally, I think also the demons kind of come in when you're on your weak spots. Like when you mm -hmm. struggle with something, if somebody struggles with depression or if they struggle with thoughts and you know that have brought them down before or things mm -hmm. that they're fighting against, I think that demons come in and try to oppress you and you have to like rebuke them yeah. daily sometimes just to get out of your head. Try to get, not let them get into your head or bring you down or give you thoughts that, or play on your thoughts that you may already have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and keep pushing you further into that. Yeah. Absolutely, Lisa. Two things on that. One, I agree. Absolutely. I've had to do that so many times. I'll be driving down the road and all of a sudden think some thought will just pop into my head about, man, how could you ever do this? Or how, you know, you, and it's these, and I think, where did that come from? Well, that sure wasn't from God. That wasn't from me. You know, that's a spirit that's trying to influence me. And I've had to do that. One oh, thing that you've actually been delivered from, mm -hmm. you know, that God, the Holy Spirit like brought you out of these things and then but the devil still knows your weakness absolutely and he will still come back and and that's not you didn't really get delivered or you mm -hmm. just didn't really have that or you still this still is happening in your life yeah. or you know you, it didn't change you just changed but this situation did. And, mm -hmm. and they like you have to it makes you like doubt and talk to, to yourself terrible then you have to like step out of it and go wait a minute yeah mm -hmm. I rebuke you, you know, you're just making Definitely. It. And I, I mean, that's, that's a, people don't realize that's like a spiritual warfare struggle daily yeah. for everyone, really. I agree 100%. We've got to be aware of it instead of just thinking, well, that was just a, man, where'd that thought come from? Or that wasn't anything. Oh, well, just ignore it. No, that is, there are spiritual stuff. So, oh, yeah. So that was one. Two is, I just watched a video of a guy who was saved out of Hollywood and he talks about some of the parties and things that he's been to where even some of the biggest name actors, like Keanu Reeves was one that he named, and some of the satanic rituals and stuff that happen in some of those private parties are unbelievable. So it, there's nothing really that surprises me anymore with, with Hollywood and what they're doing. I mean, how else? What a, what a great ploy for the devil. Let's put it out there and make it so far-fetched and make it so crazy so no one could ever believe in that. So if they talk about demons, then they're obviously crazy. I mean, what a ploy. What a ploy. That's not even why, like, what Maria was saying is so prevalent when it comes to us as Christians and not hiding from it. Even mm -hmm. if we've never had experience with it, it's still important that we... We know that knowledge and that wisdom that God has given us in His Word to not only educate ourselves but to educate our children mm -hmm. and our grandchildren and so forth and so forth. Because if we don't, if we don't recognize it, then we can stay in those rabbit holes and we can get stuck, you know, believing the lies that are yeah. being said to us. Yeah, that's why the Scripture says, "Take every thought into captivity." Exactly. And so, but how can you do that if we're not even willing to talk about it amongst, you know, each other? Like, if this is our safe haven as a fellowship and a, 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 a center for believers to fellowship together, if we can't be safe enough to talk about it with each other, then how can we go out and help others mm -hmm. who don't have a safe haven like this to talk, you know, yeah. to talk to. I think I've told you guys before, too, about the going along that same lines. You know, we get embarrassed because of it sometimes of, well, man, I can't tell anybody that that, why would that thought pop into my head or why am I struggling with this sin or what in the world, man? I, how, I never thought I would struggle with fill in the blank. And instead of, you know, because we're out in a war, and we got wounded, instead of being able to come back and be healed, you know, just like in a, one of the pastors I was talking with one day, he says, you should never apologize for some of the things you're struggling with. He says, don't apologize to me, don't apologize to anybody. He says, when a soldier gets wounded in battle, we don't shoot the soldier and leave him there for dead. We bring him back in, we try to help him, and send him back out to battle. 
So it's no surprise that those of us that are out, all of us in this room, when we're out in the world fighting the battle, that we're going to get shot at, and occasionally we're going to get hit. And so what do we have to do? We have to get back in here so we get patched up and so we can get back to the battle again. So it shouldn't surprise us. We shouldn't. There's nobody above it. I guess if you're not getting shot at, maybe you're not in the battle. But then if you're not in the battle, you're probably already shot anyways. So I'm not sure about the circular reasoning on that one. Somebody smarter than me will have to figure that one out. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Dave? I'm impressed with the orderliness of the gifts in the church. Uh, is they're, they're parts of a body, and you have to have all of them working properly so none of them get out of balance. So, for example, you have tongues, but you also have the gift of interpretation of tongues. Mm -hmm. And Paul says, I don't want you to use them one without the other. Mm -hmm. or, else you have, or else you don't have order anymore. You have chaos and confusion. Mm -hmm. You have people that can prophesy or do miracles or whatever. Well, then you have people that can distinguish between the spirits. And that's the balance to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, somebody can say, well, wait a minute. This doesn't look like it's, you know, really there's something wrong about this. And so mm -hmm. they just all work together perfectly, especially in the context of a church. Uh, and the end result is that it, it, everything works smoothly and you don't have craziness and you don't have disorder mm -hmm. uh, because God's always in control of all, of all the gifts. So Absolutely. that just really impresses me with the Yeah, gifts. it's beautiful. That, that symphony, that harmonious, harmonious working together. Yeah, that's beautiful, Dave. I love that. Bill? Uh, you know, it's... It is a spiritual warfare, like you were saying, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, and it seems like the, the more you try to get into God's Word and draw closer to Him, uh, the more you're going to be attacked, you know. Uh, yeah. I remember the first time in my late 20s, early 30s, a long time ago, <laughs> uh, I was a deacon, you know, in the church, you know. And uh, I just remember, you know, how constant Satan's attacks were on me, you know, and that was a, a beginning for me, you know, as a young Christian, you know, just to feel that. And uh, so, yeah, I, I do believe that the closer you get to God, you know, you think you got victory over certain areas in your life, and that's when Satan's going to attack you even worse, you know. And, uh, you know, uh, he's talking about David, too, and how that he looked foolish, you know. And <clears throat> so... I, you know, reading the scripture here lately too, I was, I was thinking about Jesus, how he sent the disciples out to go into the world and preach the gospel, you know. Mm -hmm. They didn't even have the Bible like we have it, you know. And, and so they had to look foolish in front of everybody, you know, uh, you know, because they're weirdos, you know. And, but, you know, look what God did through them, you know, just ordinary uh, fishermen ordinary guys just like each and every one of us and God used them in special ways and he still does it today mm -hmm. but you know we don't want to look foolish to the world too uh, been up to Sturgis on the motorcycle and seen and down in Arkansas to a bike rally and seen guys walking around carrying a cross you know some guys preaching on the corner you know and he, like those are kind of weirdos you know but uh you know, you don't know where they're coming from, you know, but I couldn't do that, you know, that's just throwing your faith out there too strong, you know, but we got to be bold in our faith too, and so we got to find that balance to share the word, you know, and and not be intimidated by the world because we're not of this world. I, I played golf the other day with a buddy and we played with a, they hooked us up with a, a young guy, he's 24 years old, real smart guy. And, uh, had a great job and I just at towards the end I thought Lord you put him here to play with us I got to speak to him about his faith you know and so the last hole I said something to him about his faith you know and uh, and he goes well I just asked him first if he went to church and he said yes and so then I said are you a believer you know and he goes yes I am you know and uh, and I could see that it was real in his life and but you know I had to take that opportunity and hopefully you know, maybe that puts something in him to be bold to in his faith, or my buddy that was playing too, but that's what we got to be about, and it doesn't always come easy, because like David, we don't, or David's wife, people might look at us and think that we're being stupid and silly, but uh, 
you've got to find that balance there yeah. somehow. Very good. Very good. I agree. Um, my supervisor on my internship is ex Mormon. And he's really against religion and especially Christianity now. Mm -hmm. um, and so at first, like, my first thought was he was like talking about it in front of all of us. I was like, wow, I didn't even know I'm Christian. And I have like a contract with someone. And so then the first thought was like, maybe just don't say anything. And then it immediately it was like, sort of like, no, like, you got to be unapologetically Christian, you know? And so, like, even though we kind of had like the religion talk, but um, God just put. God's just been putting on my heart to like pray for him, but like that feeling was there like to like curl up and not say nothing because he's your supervisor and basically runs the show. <laughs> and so it's like, do you really want to like put yourself out there and like against him? But even then, like we kind of just got to be bold and strong on our faith. So. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, it, it's so because. The devil roars like a lion. The roar causes fear, but the roar can't hurt us. So we get, I, I feel you, Jenny. So we, we get that scared, oh, man, well, it's my supervisor. It's my boss. Well, don't you think that he's in, he who is in us is greater than he in the world? He's more powerful. He could change the boss. He could. So it, it amazes me. And the more I think about it, the more I'm like, wow, you know, here I am shying away sometimes so I don't get in trouble when he can get me out of any kind of trouble I can get in, you know? <laughs> And you have an opportunity to be the example, mm -hmm. you know, better example than the one that's sticking with him right now. Very good. Anybody else? As we talk about this kind of stuff, this is, I mean, so I guess we're all in agreement then that there are these spirits. You believe in angels and demons, right? believe that demons can influence see i grew up thinking and believing that demons could not a christian couldn't be demon possessed and um the problem is the word demon possessed is not the actual word that's used in the bible it's demonized it's to be impacted or influenced by demons and i believe we as christians can be otherwise how else would those thoughts pop into our head how else would we be tempted like that and those kind of things so yes i believe there are there is that so if that means that they are influencing me and they can get inside my head sometimes, how do I get them out? Do I even know they're there? See, there's, there's a whole lot more to this that we'll talk about a little bit later. And that's why I like what Dave said. It's all the parts of the body working together. I may not realize it, but Dave may walk up to me and he's got the gift of discerning of spirits. And he'd say, hey, you know what? I feel like something's, Lord's telling me something's not right here. And that's why the whole body works so well together. And There's a big resurgence of the deliverance ministry that was really big before and kind of went away, which um, some of us went and saw that movie come out in Jesus' name that Greg Locke and some of those did that was a really powerful um, really powerful movie uh, and it wasn't really like a, what you would think of a movie, it's more like a documentary showing their church and some of these things that have happened and there is so much of that stuff going on and so many Christians who are living in bondage that they don't even realize they're living in bondage they have no idea that there's freedom available so we've got to be on it Things like this, and you bring up talk 
topics like this that are sometimes uncomfortable, you know, but you put yourself out there to help bring that up, and I, and I feel like that's really admirable for you to let the Holy Spirit do you like that, to feel like, okay, I need to bring this up, even though it's not, not a hot topic. There's a lot of hot topics in church, <laughs> a lot of hot topics, but yeah, see, that's the, you know, we think about these demons and I mean, uh, uh, demonic influences and all that. And as Christians, you know, we struggle, we say we have that, we struggle with things. We don't sin, we struggle with things, right? Oh man, I tripped up. No, you sinned. Let's just be real. So does that, where do you think that influence is coming from? Where do you think that, as Paul, the word Paul uses, a besetting sin, that, that habit that you can't kick. Where do you think that comes from? If, if when I am a, become a Christian, old things, the old life's passed away, all things become new, the new life begins. If I don't have to sin, I have that. Where do you think those influences are coming from? Where is that temptation coming from? Well, if it's not from God and it's not from me, then where's it coming from? Yeah, it's the enemy. No question. Demons, Satan. You can say the words. It's okay. Demons, Satan, they're real. Yeah, so if they're hitting us then, and they're around us, then, you know, it makes it immediately the verse that came to my mind is Mark 16, where the Great Commission, it says, these miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. You know, why are we not seeing more Christians get free from the things that they're struggling with? Because we use words like they're struggling with it. Uh, you know, it's, it's not that, it, and it is a struggle, but where's the struggle coming from? I think there's a lot more of our struggles that are spiritual than what we think they are. Do you have your hand up, Noemi? Yeah, um, I actually just read something recently that just, you know, people get freaked out when you say demon possessed or demonized or influenced by demons, but um, I heard it described in a really like down to earth way where like if you had, if you came home and there was a robber in your house, he doesn't own your house. But if you let him stay there, he's gonna take all your stuff and, you know. But, and so like when when we give place to the devil, he doesn't own us because we belong to God. But we are giving, we're not making him leave, we're giving him place and footholds, you know, by allowing, you know, sin that we continue. And so we have to make him leave, you know. Um, and so I just thought that was a good. That's a good illustration. It's very good. Can everybody hear the illustration she used there? Good. Anybody else before we finish up? One thing that kind of keeps coming back to me is the, huh? the demons are going to be smart about it. They're not going to walk through the front door and announce themselves. You know, the, the greatest um, military strategists don't come through the front gate. They sneak in the back. And they don't announce themselves under cover of darkness. Yeah, that's why the, the, the scripture says that he'll uh, disguise himself as an angel of light. But they also wait for you to open the door. You know, yeah. You enter yeah, as a Christian, they can't come in unless we open the door. And that's by looking at something we shouldn't, by giving in to something we should, allowing the temptation, yielding to the temptation, that opens the door to allow them in. Or things that we can even allow in our home that can open a door. All right, I'll tell. I don't know, like for Christians, I don't know why you can't believe the whole like you can totally actively doors can be open. I don't for an unsafe person I believe that, but I mean, if Satan's coming at you and telling you things to do or uh, bad things to think about yourself or something, you're choosing mm -hmm. to do that, and so if. It's your, you're struggling because you're choosing to make that choice. The demons aren't making you do anything. Just no, they like, can't make you. Just like the Holy Spirit yeah. can. I mean, he could make you, but he doesn't make you do anything. Mm -hmm. So it's your choice yeah, to get those demons. And sure. I, would, I don't think, I think an unsafe person, they could choose, but they also, I think a demon could go into anything they wanted to without their choice. 
And that's where you've got to you've got to understand the difference between de- the, what we have always heard as demon possession versus being demonized, impacted, and influenced by demons. We're not talking about the Exorcist or something crazy like that, where this person's just full of demons or legion in the Bible or something like that. I don't think that a Christian is going to be at that level. Yeah. But we can be demonized. We can be have demons that. Uh, We've allowed, yeah, oppressed is a good word. Um, it comes into our definitions. So when I sin willingly, I open the door. I mean, you'll even see in Scripture where it talks about giving place to the devil. That's written to Christians. How can I give place in me to the devil if he's not allowed in me? So I am choosing to allow those things in. I wonder what things are actually Satan and what they do with the demons. Because, like, the angels have different jobs than the Lord does. And then, mm-hmm. I mean, they're not very specific on what the demons do. They're just carrying out Satan's will. Well, there's a lot of names for them in Scripture. They're, they're called, the, there's the spirits of, we've got the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge. There's all these kind of things. And those, I believe, are angelic beings. Those are carrying out God's mm-hmm. plan. But there's also a lot of other spirits that are talked about there. There's the spirit of divination. There's a spirit of this, a spirit of that. And so just like angels carry out God's plan, I believe that there are demons that carry out Satan's plan, and they're, they're each kind of skilled and gifted in different areas. You know, a spirit of, of lying or something like somebody who struggles with that. I believe it's the same kind of thing on both sides. So it's not one demon can do all kinds of different things. Yeah. I mean, and if you look at the names that are used for some of the demons in Scripture and you look at what they actually mean, they're very specific as to a sin, what we would call a sin today. So that's, that's a pretty neat study to, to kind of look into, and we don't have time to do that on a Sunday morning. Well, maybe we should. I also think demons dwell in some places. Mm-hmm. Like, because they're well, like, I firmly believe saying, that. Yeah, exactly, because, you know, people will be like, there's a ghost, you know, in the, but there's no other way to explain what's going on there besides a demon mm-hmm. has been hanging out there and is doing things. I've been in a lot of churches that have got a lot of demons in them. And I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about real demons. I mean, I've seen things in churches that would make your hair, like, fall out like mine did. <laughs> Freak you out. Rick? I would just say that uh, Neil Anderson on this specific mm-hmm. topic, yep. Neil, Neil Anderson, Anderson has got a lot of great books on this. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the... One of the key ways that you can um, identify that influence in your life is just to ask yourself, you know, when you have that thought, if you're sitting in the middle of church and there's a great worship service going on, and, you know, you remember that specific thing that you did in the past, or all of a sudden a really inappropriate thought blasts in your head, you just ask yourself, did I think that? Mm-hmm. Did God make? No. Okay, so then there's some, you know, there is temptation going on coming from outside myself. Um, and for, for Christians especially, a lot of negative self-talk is, is demonic. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, you, like God values you. Mm-hmm. He loves you so much, but he died for you. Is he going to tell you you're worthless? You are priceless. Absolutely. You have to recognize when you're dealing with this stuff, when you have those negative self thoughts, you don't fight for victory. The victory has already been given to you. You get to fight from a place where you realize, I won. I'm a child of the king. Mm -hmm. The creator of the universe gives me value. Absolutely. I've, I've been there. I've, I've had these battles. And, I mean, it just, pardon me, it pisses me off. <laughs> you know, when, when you have, when you have something that has rejected God on every facet of its very existence and has been around to study humankind since Adam and Eve fell. They don't have to necessarily live in your brain. They don't have to read your thoughts. They are better than a thousand psychiatrists all in the same room, okay? They don't have to 
They don't have to read your mind to know what you're thinking. They, study, they have studied you since the day you were born. They know if they put this situation in front of you, what you're going to do, how you're going to think about it, how you're going to want to react to it. Mm -hmm. They know what type of idiot driver to put in front of me, <laughs> right, to make me lose my cool. Um, all this is to say, sorry, I'm rambling. That's okay. <laughs> this, is, this, is very, this is very real. Mm -hmm. It's very serious. And it's okay to be, for us to be very mad at the idiots in Hollywood who have allowed themselves to become controlled by these forces to simply like oversaturate us with it so that we're desensitized to it. You know, I, I mean, I, okay, Lindsay and I, sorry, we, we occasionally watch Ghost Hunters, right? <laughs> Okay. Just throw your wife right and under we the bus, crack right? Just throw up. Her right like there are right. times when we crack up about it because it's like they yeah. ain't talking to a human. Mm -hmm. They think it's a you know some deceased little girl who's like, I just want to be friends. No, <laughs> no, you know that's a sign. Like no, everything's a hostile presence. <laughs> but it, it's it's here, it's real. You as a as a Christian. You have been sealed, right? You can't, to exactly what Ruby was saying, they're not, they're not going to make us do things. They can't make us do things. But man, they know the psychological buttons to push mm -hmm. to make it really easy for us to go down that path. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. So I'm, I'm done. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. That's good. Thank you. Tommy? Um, to what Rick was talking about, I was with my sister-in-law, and I had witnessed to her, and it just seemed to go nowhere. And um, one time, she was telling me about her deceased stepmother moving things around the house to let her know, mm. to let the daughter, the real daughter, know she was still there. And, and I said, it's demons. There isn't anybody there moving things around your house, but demons. And... That, that's just, um, years ago at Open Door, we learned, and I don't remember what the context was, but there was something that was in my mind that I learned, and I still use it this day, and it's, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the power of his shed blood, I claim my deliverance from the power and the persuasion of Satan. And I still use that when you yeah. can tell he's putting thoughts in your head, like Rick said. Yeah, absolutely. We can command them to leave. I mean, we can command them to go from anywhere. Yeah, well, we can't. It's not us. It's through, That's just like the guys that came up and said, well, but, you know, the Peter I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And Jesus I know, but who are you? You know, that's what the demons would be saying to me. <laughs> who are you again? <laughs> well, we know you, but not from that, but no. <laughs> um, yeah, in the name and through the blood of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. And they have to because... We're calling from the place of power with the name of power and what gives us the power. So definitely, Connie, that's very good. Yeah. I think some of the some of the issue with people today, and this is really big with kids today too, is just, you know, we were created to walk with God. We were created to um, crave Him. And um, people crave the supernatural. Mm -hmm. but they're craving the wrong supernatural. And so, like, Satan knows that. Like, we were made to crave God, and he is supernatural. You know, the Holy Spirit is supernatural. And when you experience his power, it's intoxicating, but people are not, like, either being shown him or, like, we're not doing our job, you know, introducing them to him. Um, and Satan's doing a very good job of, I mean, even, like, you know, crystals and all this this other stuff like that is what he's using to because people are craving that something supernatural mm -hmm. and they're getting it there yeah they're starting them very very young ages i mean it's it's incredible the stuff that's that's out there good dave you ready to wrap us up You know, Bill, you were talking about it's a it's a spiritual warfare out there, uh, and I think the demons are pretty much out in the open and running things now. Yeah. I mean, we we're celebrating well, we're not, but 
Thir June is a pride month, and people are celebrating something that God destroyed civilizations over. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, how far have we come the wrong direction? And if I were to say that on Facebook or at work or at school, I would be canceled, I would be attacked, I would have people that would want to kill me if they could get away with it uh, by daring to say something like that, that that years ago everybody would have, would have agreed. But we've gone so far the, the wrong direction uh, that the demons are pretty much just running things now. And if anybody speaks against it, uh, you know, God help you, literally. Yeah. Uh, but the main thing I wanted to say is that um, we sang some songs today, and they were about Jesus having power over the grave, and that that's not the end, uh, and that we have a vital, living Holy Spirit inside of us. Well, the other day, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito were on the Howard Stern Show. Now, I don't listen to the Howard Stern Show, <laughs> uh, but I read an article about it, uh, and, and Arnold, that wise uh, prophet, said, uh, if anybody ever told to tell told you, you gotta say it like this. yeah, I'm not, I can't talk like that. Uh, if anybody ever told you that there was something that you would there, there's a heaven or somewhere you go after you die, he was effing lying to you. And I'm thinking, Arnold, you just called Jesus a liar. I do not want to be in your shoes when you stand before God one day and defend that statement. And his little brother, Danny DeVito, was on the, the same uh, program with him. And Danny was saying, yes, effing right. You just deteriorate. You just rot. That's all there is. And they must have gone on probably half a dozen more times using the F word about how stupid it was to think that there was anything beyond the grave uh, or that there was such thing as a heaven. And I'm thinking, you know, well, that's what the world's thinking more and more these days. We are becoming an increasingly small remnant uh, uh, in this world that believe in the Lordship of Christ uh, and the sovereignty of Scripture. Uh, but all it does is, uh, to me is it proves the truth of the Bible uh, when we see this happening the, the way it's happening. Like I think Connie said many times before, I, was, I know the end of the book uh, because we're seeing it happen before our very eyes. So. Let's close. Dear God, we thank you that we do know the truth and his name is Jesus. Uh, Father, we pray that as difficult as it may be, uh, we will serve you, we will walk with you, we will love you, we will believe you, uh, and Lord, we will just uh, uh, be willing to stand with you till the end, dear Lord. Father, we pray you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit. We know you're real. Uh, Father, we know that we'll all stand before you one day, and we're so thankful that we'll stand there wrapped in the robes of Jesus Christ's righteousness, for, Father, if we've believed in him. Lord, we love you, and we praise you. We praise that you would just send us our way today, uh, rejoicing in what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.